see, the greatest single specific barrier to getting an answer to our prayers is pride. And anything that will get that barrier out of the way will facilitate the answer to our prayers. God has been speaking to me personally just lately about the awful dangers of pride. I've hated pride for years, but I got a new vision of how vicious and how evil pride is and how it keeps us back from all the blessings that God intends for us. This message runs through the Bible. It's a universal truth. It was not demonstrated first on earth. You know the first demonstration of the evil of pride? What was the first sin in the history of the universe? Tell me. Pride, yes. Who committed the sin? Lucifer, that's right. An angel in heaven. And if that pride, if pride as a sin could break out in heaven and cause an angel to lose his place, how much more susceptible are we likely to be to pride, to pride as sinners here on earth? Jesus mentions eight specific activities. Eating, drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, buying and selling, building and planting. So I want to ask you, is there anything intrinsically sinful about any of those activities? The answer is no. What was the problem? The problem was they were so immersed in those activities that they didn't recognize the days in which they were living. I would sum that problem up in one word, materialism. They were so immersed in the material that they no longer had any understanding or alertness for the spiritual and the eternal. So let's call feature number five materialism. How much materialism is there in our Western civilization to gain? I would say it is virtually inundated with it. And believe me, it is by no means excluded from the church. I think there are many professing Christians who are in their hearts just as materialistic as the people of the world. Maybe a little less demonstrative about it. They don't show it in their lifestyle. But they are absorbed with materialism. And Jesus warned us that if we are sucked in into that pit of materialism, we will not be ready when he comes. We will be in the same category as the people of Noah's day and Lot's day. I, I share something that God sometimes impels me to share. It's very difficult to share. It's very painful. But after my After God called my wife Ruth home to himself, I went through a time of deep grief. But I learned how much people loved me. It was a revelation. I got letters from many different parts of the world, people from different races, different denominational backgrounds comforting me, assuring me of their love and their prayers. I, it was a, I never knew there was so much love in the world till that happened. I didn't know that so many people <laughs> loved me and I'm sure I'm not an easy person to love. But that's what I believe God is waiting for. It's that we love one another with his divine love. And then God calls us to the ongoing ministry of intercession. And I believe that worship and intercession are perhaps the two highest ministries of which Christians are capable. Intercession means literally, the word means coming in between. So intercession is coming in between God and somebody who needs God. It's totally 
unself-centered. It's where we get released from our selfishness. You've probably heard somebody describe the typical prayer of the average church member. God bless me and my wife, my son John and his wife, us four, no more, amen, Acts 2-4. That's not intercession. Now, Jesus is the perfect intercessor. But, like everything, he wants to share with us. So intercession is not thinking up what you should pray about. Intercession is opening yourself to the Lord through the Holy Spirit and letting him share his burden with you. And in real intercession, burden is a true description. God places a burden upon people. In Acts 13, the first, quote, missionary journey, how did it start? There were five leaders ministering to the Lord. They didn't have a prayer meeting. They didn't have a business meeting. They came together to meet with the Lord. And out of that, they got the Lord's direction. Separate me. Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. That was a successful work. Why? Because it proceeded out of God's initiative. And I, I suggest to you, if you don't want to waste your time and your strength, don't get launched into things that are not initiated by God. Because ultimately, there will be no permanent fruit whatever. And in a sense, it is arrogance on our part to assume that we can offer God our good ideas and get him to bless them. He's not interested in doing that. 2 Timothy 1, 9. We have to read the last verse, the last word of verse 8, which is God. And then we go on with verse 9. God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So that scripture says that if you are saved, you are also called. Let me ask you a question tonight. Ponder on it for a moment and then respond. How many of you here tonight know that you are saved? All right. Now, if I were to ask how many of you know that you are called, I doubt whether... All right. How many of you know that you are called? That's a good response. <coughs> the fact of the matter is that many, many Christians who know that they are saved do not know that they are also called. If you are saved, you are called. You may not know it, but you are called. Because God, when God saves us, he also calls us. And Paul says, with a holy calling. It's very important to understand that God has a calling for you which is holy. It is something that you need to treat with the greatest reverence and respect. It is a treasure. It's more valuable than any earthly treasure that you can ever possess. Lord Jesus, I thank you that on the cross you were made a curse that I might be redeemed from every curse and inherit God's blessing. On that basis, I ask you to release me and set me free to receive the deliverance I need. Now, sorry that I shouldn't, have, you don't have to follow that. Anyhow, we're coming now to the vital point. I take my stand with you, Lord, against all Satan's demons. I submit to you, Lord, and I resist the devil. Amen. Amen. Now we come to the point where you expel. Now I speak to any demons that have control over me. 
Now you speak to them directly. I command you to go from me now. In the name of Jesus, I expel you. Now come out in the name of Jesus. I've often asked people this question. Which kind of situation would you rather live in? A country with good people and bad laws. Or, or, or a country with good laws and bad people. Well, you're silly if you don't answer a country with bad laws and good people because bad people can make good laws bad. We've seen that very clearly demonstrated in the last few decades. And you see, you need to bear in mind laws do not change the hearts of people. Laws can, to a certain extent, restrain crime. And that's very important. But with regard to abortion, as I understand it, in France they've now more or less perfected a pill which guarantees abortion. There is no legal way you can prevent people using that pill. All you'll do is start a black market in pills. I don't believe that the passing of laws from now on can rectify this situation. If it could, by all means, let's do what we can. But I really believe the remedy is to change the hearts of people. One thing is very significant about the, the ministry of Jesus. All sorts of social evils existed in his day. Slavery, etc. And he never preached against them. He never dealt with social problems. He always dealt with the root problem, which is the human heart. And his aim was to change the hearts of men and women. And the only power that can do that is the power of the gospel with the Holy Spirit. And that, in my opinion, is far the most effective answer. That doesn't mean to say we don't use other means if they'll work, if they're practical, if they're available. If you talk about the exchange that happens at the cross, can you tell me a bit about that? Well, that was something that came to me by revelation because I realized that the cross is the center of the whole Christian faith and that if we only want to receive all that God has for us, we have to understand what took place when Jesus died on the cross. And gradually, little by little, God showed me that there was an exchange. All the evil that was due to our disobedience and our sin was visited upon Jesus. That all the good that was due to Jesus perfect obedience and holiness might be made available to us and in the end I came up with a list of eight different exchanges all of which took place on the cross and I'll just read the list out Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven Jesus was wounded that we might be healed Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness that we might become righteous with his righteousness Jesus died our death, that we might receive his life. Jesus endured our poverty, that we might share his abundance. Jesus bore our shame, that we might share his glory. Jesus endured our rejection, that we might have his acceptance with God the Father. Jesus was made a curse, that we might receive the blessing. And I have discovered that really is the key to happiness and success. You see, there are some things that don't come without suffering. I'm always, I've always been amazed at Paul's prayer in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him, Jesus. That's wonderful. We all say that. And the power of his resurrection. Well, we all say that. But the next verse, and the fellowship of his sufferings. And many, many times I said to the Lord, as I read that verse, Lord, I don't know that I can really say that. Do I really want to know the fellowship of your suffering? I'm an honest person. I think that's perhaps one of the basic benefits of God's dealing with me. I am honest to myself. I'm honest to others. I said, Lord, many times I'm really not sure I can say that I want to know the fellowship of your sufferings. And the Lord is very patient with me. He didn't pressure me. But you see, I've come to see that some things only come by suffering. 
Suffering does something that nothing else will do. It prepares the soil for that fountain. And when you go through the valley, you're sharing something very precious, very wonderful. You'll come closer to the Lord than you've ever been. And that's what God wants. He's not interested in us suffering, but he's interested in sharing his sufferings with us. I'm not talking about the sufferings of Jesus on the cross. Those were unique. Only he could do that. But I'm talking about the sufferings of Jesus for the church. I don't want to be superficial. I don't want to be just a churchgoer. Lord, I want to bring joy to your heart. I want you to be satisfied with me, not with what I do, but with me.